Mulling Show here on the Barn Burner TV network on Zinco TV channel 250. You can download the Zinco TV app for any iOS or Android device and watch us on any smart TV 2016 and up. And today I have Grammy nominated producer slash 20, 28 years music executive, Christy Barber, and that is shrinking it down little because <laughs> her <laughs> contribution to the music industry is large. Welcome to the show, my girl. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh my gosh, I am so excited to get your story out. I know those in the industry knew, know the contribution you have brought to the industry, but I'm excited for the world to know how much you have done in this industry. And I just wanna start off with um, saying, like I read the bio and everything, and it said from at the young age of 10, you already knew you wanted to go in this music industry path and you had in your head from then that you wanted to work at Columbia Records. Who knows that? Yep. This, this yep. I did, uh, before I get, yeah, before I answer your question, what I wanted to say, and I'm sure everybody in Canada is aware of this, but anybody else that's watching in the Caribbean or in the U.S. or out, you know, reggae fans around the world, I want people to understand that the Canadian royal family of reggae is the Malins family. And I would love to, you know, uh, pay tribute to your father and, 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 and tribute of this interview to your father, who is one of my mentors. The first time I went to Canada on business was with your father. So I just really want people to understand that like, this is a really big honor for me. And I cannot say enough of how proud I am of you and your sister and everything you guys have accomplished. I know your dad would be so proud. So I don't want to make you cry at the beginning of the interview, but I just wanted to state that. So people really understand the impact that you guys have had on our genre. A lot of people forget territories outside of the Caribbean or Jamaica and in Canada. I mean, you are an icon and you, you have, you know, a walk of fame and you've got Juno awards, which if anybody's not familiar, it's like the Grammy award of of Canada. So people really need to, um, who aren't in the know, need to know that I'm actually being interviewed by an icon. Oh, <laughs> so. thank you, girl. Oh, thank you. You know, my daddy loved you to pieces. Oh, you no, know. one of my favorites. Definitely. Absolutely. You know, that, that's yes, a big I, miss for us in reggae, oh, but we got you, you and your sister carrying yeah. the torch, which is great. So I, I'm happy that I've pretty much known your family my whole career. And you're right. When I was, I mean, um, at age three, actually, I got my first record and I actually still have it in mint condition and I can play it. Wow. And actually, that artist who inspired me at age three actually signed my Grammy medal. I go and see him in concert to this day every year. And that's Tom Jones. So, I mean, wow. I literally I have every record, every seven inch from when I was three years old. But at 10 was when I got obsessed with the Grammys. And I used to and my mom tells the story all the time. I used to unplug the phones so I didn't get disturbed why the Grammy Awards were on. And I yeah. always knew that I wanted to be a producer, not understanding what it was when I was younger. And then, yeah, Columbia Records was the record label I wanted to work for when Wham! came on the scene with um, George Michael. He said, I got this tattoo, a couple of them. Yeah, um, I <laughs> so I went, right, basically yeah. at age 13, when I found love with him, I knew that's where I wanted to work because um, George Michael was signed there. That's where Wham! was. Yeah. And ironically, uh, Columbia ended up being the second label I worked for, but the first la the label I was able to pr produce my first record at. So ironically, as a producer that I wanted to be and never knew what it was when I was 10, that was the label I got to do it at. So, yeah. <laughs> but, okay, so who, even though you said at 10, you, you knew you wanted to do that, who made you feel you wanted to do that? Was it anybody in your family in the industry or you just- no. No, no, no. I'm from Lansing, Michigan, um, the capital city of Michigan, not too far from Canada. So we used to be able to drive over the border and I used yeah. to live in the Upper Peninsula, which is right by St. Sault Ste. Marie. So in the 70s, we used to go across the bridge to go to McDonald's. <laughs> There's my Canada story. But no, nobody in my family was. I was musically obsessed. I spent all my money on concert tickets, waiting in line for hours and hours to get seats to uh, concerts, spent all of my money on music. And I knew that in order to get in the music industry, you would have to move to New York City. I had it in my head. So at age 20, I actually moved to New York. I knew no one. It's like the Madonna story, who's also from Michigan. $20 yeah. to my name. And within the first six months, I was a music journalist. So yeah, I really hustled my way. I had no connections. I had no idea what I was doing. I just knew that I was driven from the age of three. So after all those years of buildup, I think that's kind of what probably worked for me. 
Yeah. So when you worked in um, doing the journalism, you were doing you were working more with rap artists and writing about rap for Rap Master magazine. And um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I actually, well, because I'm musically I'm eclectic, I listen to all types of music. Actually, my all time favorite is like 80s British music and I do DJs, but it's like 70 light rock. So it's really across the board. And when I did move to New York, I was a big hip hop head. I was obsessed with a tribe called Quest and KRS-One and bands like that. So I, and I, when I got to New York, I, I knew a little, bu- little bit about reggae, not, not as much as I do now. I mean, I had a few albums in my collection. I think uh, yeah. Melly Maker's first album, Bob Marley Legend. And I had Shabba's album because of the jam with Karis One because he was one of my favorite rappers and he was featured on the record. But so I kind of got introduced to it when I was in New York because it was just everywhere. It was on all the radio stations on Sunday. But yeah, when I first got there, I was I worked for Rap Masters, which is owned by Word Up as well. And then I ended up becoming a staff writer for Word Up and I had two monthly columns with Word Up. And um, actually, as a journalist is when I tripped on the artist. Yeah, exactly. That was the name of my column. That was, and I actually have almost probably every that Latin music review. I couldn't, I can't speak yeah. a lick of Spanish, but I used yeah. to do. I interviewed like Jennifer Lopez and Luis Miguel, and it was amazing. Ricky yeah. Martin before he did like English speaking records. It was crazy. Shakira, you name it. But um, yeah. there was an artist who's my mentor in the reggae industry that. I really wanted to interview, and ironically enough, he was signed to Columbia Records, and that's yeah. kind of where it all started um, when I interviewed him, and you know, and after interviewing him for like five hours, he graced me with that long of an interview. It moved me so much by hearing his story and how much the music meant to him, how much Jamaica meant to him. I pretty much decided after I walked out of that interview, I was going to make it my life's work to get this published. And I actually um, got it published on the cover of a magazine out of Cleveland called It's a Rap that Def Jam used to fund. So I worked for It's a Rap for, I was working with a lot of different magazines, but I stayed with It's a Rap for many, many years. And they actually gave me my first cover story, which was this artist that I sought out to interview. And that's kind of really the first article that got me um, all of, you know, my spearhead me into journalism. And then just interviewing all the rappers, R&B artists, pop acts, but then the reggae thing, my fr- the reggae thing started to take off, but my first industry job was, ironically enough, with KRS-One. I got hired to be his director of operations for his label in Jersey, and we were in the process of writing his biography. So I was going to write his bio, and I was going on tour with him when he did a speech tour. So I used to be on the tour bus doing interviews, trying to put the... um, the book together for him. And then um, an artist that I'd also started with in reggae, not one that I did the interview with, which everybody knows is super cat who I also yeah, super cat. So I have tattooed to me. That's the reason my industry the artist I actually started working with was Spraga Benz with his first album. Huh? It's freezing on me. I don't know why. Oh, okay. Oh, oh okay. So, um, yeah, actually, I'm not sure why either. It just kind of, yeah, it just told me that it's kind of like, the, the, I don't know why the connection just got, maybe it's because it's Sunday night. We are we yeah. supposed to have thunderstorms in the area, so hopefully we don't have a problem. Is okay. it okay now? Yeah, you're coming out. I'm trying it's to not- listen to it on. Yep, you're okay now. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, perfect. No, so I, so basically, um, like I was saying, the first artist that I really started to work for in the reggae industry was Sparga Benz. I started uh, to do the publicity and promotions for his first album, Jack It Up. And um, when he got, and that was with VP Records. That's the first time I met VP Records when I was doing promotion for Spraga. And then he he got signed to Capitol Records. And he asked me to come in and do publicity and promotion for him. major. And Chris was so gracious. He was like, you know, you're the type of artist that we need to have at the label. So go fly little birdie fly yeah. and of course so he supported me he actually got on a remix for me on that album with Spraga too the good day remix so he, yeah. you know still to this day he supports me so he was very gracious in letting me kind of make that transition from his record his, you know his entertainment company to my first record label um gig okay nice so that's um so that's when you started to you were doing both of them you said Columbia and KRS one right at the same time well, no, actually, well, actually, I was with Karis One and I left him to go to Capitol with Spraga. And then when I was working with Spraga, that's when the opportunity came up for Cap of, with Columbia because um, 
super cat who I had interviewed and remained friends with. And, you know, uh, we spoke all the time, talked a lot of industry stuff. He had um, a project coming up and he wanted to bring me into Columbia. He wanted me to be a part of his team. So yeah. I went and interviewed over at Columbia and they, cause they had everybody at that time. They had Cobra, they had Ine Kamosi, they had Whirl Girl, they had Carla Marshall, Diana King, the, yeah. you know, Mad Cobra. There was a ton of people over there. So they needed somebody to kind of help with the promotions and publicity and stuff like that. So I was actually working working at Capitol and Columbia at the same time, because they knew I was Braga's project, but it was a bigger yeah. position for me at Columbia to oversee that whole, um, that, that whole Rasta. And we had Tiger, Tony Rebel, I mean, you name it, between Columbia and Chaos, there were two separate yeah. labels. So then I went over there, I kind of transitioned out of Capitol and went to Columbia Records. So my second label oh. finally got to Columbia, which is where I wanted to be. So yeah. Yeah, that, that just blows me away, that whole story, because you wanted that from day one and then you end up there. That is so cool. Yeah, and then, I mean, I can keep going, and you, if you want no. me to, just the timeline. Yeah, time. This is I want your story out there because I said, like, twenty-eight years music executive in this game, you've done so much, and the titles are so many titles that you have in this industry, working with different record companies. So that's what I wanted to say. Every company you worked out exactly what was your position working with the artists as well. You know, right? Well, I'll just you really push I'll, them all to get them known, right? As well, like your work behind them is what really helped them get them out there, which was very important because like uh, Supercat was saying, they kind of didn't understand the, the what they needed, right? And you were there right. to do that. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I can kind of do the timeline quickly and we can go back if there's anything you yeah. want to talk about, but I can make it kind of quick, not dr too drug out. So yeah. while I was at Capitol, I, I worked the roster over there, obviously Supercat being one of my priorities, wrote a lot of the bios, did all the marketing. So I kind of developed uh, a lot of how we do and the teams that we put together, some of the most iconic publicity teams, promotional teams uh, out of the major labels that broke some of the biggest records that we've had in reggae have come from teams that I've actually put together from the early stages. So um, when I was at Columbia, the record I told you I produced, um, there was a kid that was signed to Rough House and he was, he was a reggae artist out of Montserrat and they needed some get out the gate so I produced a record with him in Spraga Ben so ironically enough it took me back to Spraga sitting at Columbia producing a record with him so that was actually the first record I produced was a, a single for um, Rough House Records which is the label that the Fugees were signed to via Columbia Records so Rough House has had a lot of really big acts so um then I was at Columbia for a few years and then I got a call to be the director of marketing and promotions at Polygram for Island Jamaica. So yeah. that was- With Chris Blackwell. Was that actually even a bigger position for me? So I left Columbia and I went to Island Jamaica and there we did Dance Hall Queen and I had Chevelle Franklin and then I had uh, Beanie Man. Um, I think that, is it, is it, it's not freezing again, is it? No, it's no, kind I, of I, just it I don't, I have no clue why. That was with Chris oh, Blackwell, right? Right, um, yeah, yep, yep. And I, so we did, we did the Dance All Queen movie, which is the, was, was at the time the highest growth scene Jamaican movie out of the Caribbean. We actually, yeah. I actually literally not only did the movie, but the soundtrack, the music and everything. I actually did the um, distribution of the movie as well, because it was supposed to go directly to DVD. So we okay. set up the, um, the uh, in you know at the movie theaters in the U.S. and within the Caribbean. So then we also had Chevelle Franklin. We had Beanie Man. Uh, Buju Buju Bantan was now over with us too because he used yeah. to be at Mercury and then he that label kind of folded. So he came over to Island Jamaica, and I started with Buju and Jermaine to do Inner Heights. Nice and. I actually, um, I mean, I, that was the time I loved working with Beanie. I'd been working with Shocking Vibes for a minute by the time I got into Island Jamaica. So I was super excited to work with him again. So it was great going all over the world with um, Chevelle and Beanie to promote Dance All Queen. But um, when we started Inner Heights, it was getting a little, there's some executives over there that weren't seeing eye to eye with Jermaine and Mark. I wasn't happy about it. So um, on a Monday, I actually... Uh, got up and I resigned and I took the Inner Heights record with me because I just, go ahead. Go ahead. I no, finish? I was going to say the same time 
that's the same um, place you were Island Jamaica when you were a part of marketing for Third World Cop as well, right? I don't want to leave out that. Well, you actually, I came, I come back to that. <laughs> oh, okay. Memories of, yeah, it was like you know, like the flip flop thing. Yeah, we're we're now it's ninety seven. We haven't done Third World Cop yet. This is like oh, okay. uh, the end of ninety seven when I walked away and I took Inner Heights and I actually that's how VP Records ended up with Inner Heights because I took the record over there, but then I also signed Buju to a punk label called Epitaph out of LA where he did Unchained Spirit. They were friends of mine that I'd been doing business with and I found him a new label home. But in the meantime, while he was doing that and I was working with them, I started at Electra and I was working with Sly and Robbie on the album where they won their Grammy. Their, I think it was their first Grammy with um, yeah. where they didn't, yeah, Sly and Robbie friends. So yeah, yeah I was yeah. at Electra doing that. And while I was there, is when I, and remember I've been friends with VP Records since I started my career. And um, like I said, I did um, Sprague's Jacket Up. I took Inner Heights over there, even though I was working at other majors. I got the call. Um, they asked me to become and be, be the director of AR for for um, for VP. So this was like the late nineties. So I left Electra, went over to VP and that's where I signed Buccaneer and Lexus. And I put together Tanto Metro and Devante. And, you know, at that time we had had, you know, then we had Beanie Man over there too. So like I could bring in my records that I could produce. I had Morgan Heritage at that time too with Don't Have a Dread. I mean, there was just so much great music coming out of VP in the late, you know, in the late nineties and um, was there for a, for a little bit. And then while I was there, I actually got the call from the, um, the directors and the producers of Third World Cop. And they okay. asked me if I would come back in. So actually VP Records graciously let me work independently on that film because it had been the same family that we worked together on Dance Hall Queen. And they asked me to come back in and do Third World Cop. So I did. So I was able to do that while I was at VP. But shortly thereafter, I got the call from Stephen Marley. And basically, it, the, the, the uh, Tough Gong reverted to the family in the late 90s. Chris Blackwell used to run the yeah. estate while it was reverting to the family. So when the family got it reverted to them in the late 90s, they needed executives to come in and run it. And they called, Stephen Marley called me on the phone and said, will you come back over? The Polygram building is now owned by Universal. Will you come back over and help us run this label? So when the kids took over the estate, I came in. So I was there with them. And that's when... I started, you know, we, Damien had just, I'd, I'd helped the family when I was at Island Jamaica. That's when I got very close with them. I was helping with some marketing on the Fallen Fall is Babylon album at Electra with the Melody Makers. And I was helping Julian and Damien with their debut records. So we kind of had already had that relationship, um, you know, working with Steven with Chan Down Babylon, which you can see over my head. And, you know, so. Scroll up, scroll up, girl, let's show a little bit. <laughs> I was like, there, there you go, there you go. So, yeah. and then basically, you know, Damien was just, but that's what I was excited about because dance hall is really my forte. That's what I'm known for. So yeah. everybody thought it was crazy that I was leaving VP in its heyday to come on over with the Marleys when Damien was still just kind of, you know, everybody, you know, the Melody Makers had just broken up. You know, yeah. uh, Damien was out there. Everybody's like, what are you going to do? I was kind of excited about breaking new ground and trying to break new acts. But I love the challenges. So yeah. I've actually been with Damien and Steven. I mean, we started, we had ghetto use together. So I, I was the president of Tough Gone Ghetto Use at Def Jam for yeah. many, many years. So, you know, obviously I did Halfway Tree. I did uh, Welcome to Jam Rock. Um, you know, AR and I uh, was the president of the label at the time. Mind control was Stephen Marley. And then when we had some off time with the family, um, the the uh, general manager of Def Jam came to me and wanted to do a record and he needed yeah. an idea. Um, they had an album through the Heineken Music Initiative. They had a deal that they had to do another project with them. So yeah. he said, well, if I gave you this project and I and I was your partner in it, what would you want to do? And that's when I came up with the Def Jamaica concept, which is the oh. album that was nominated for a Grammy, which makes me a Grammy nominated producer because of that album, which is by far probably still my favorite project I've done. Yeah, and yeah. then um, in 2008, I decided I was going to leave the family. I'd been going back and forth to Nash Nashville um, thinking I might want a change of you know scenery because I'd been in New York for over 20 years. Yeah. So in 2008, I was going to go independent. But then Chris and Randy from VP came back to me again and said, well, how about you come in and be the vice president of VP Records? So I said, yeah. you know what? 
let's do it. So then I went back to VP Records. And um, so I was at VP. Yeah. So I was at VP. That's where I produced more Morgan Heritage. That's when I got to do work with uh, Busy Signal, Romaine Virgo. And that's where I did my Reggae's Gone Country project, which is probably my most critically acclaimed project to date. It was a very big. You produced that with uh, Dean Fraser. That and John Rich from um, Big and Rich here in Nashville. He's a big country artist here, big country singer songwriter. So yeah, we did that project. And and, and actually, funny enough, while I was there, I ended up uh, doing Stephen Marley's album too. And I was promoting Damien and Nas's record. The family, yeah. I mean, both families have been supportive. Like the Marleys have always been supportive of me working with the Chins at VP. And VP yeah. has always been supportive of me working with the Marley family. It's kind of a, when you deal with me, you got to know that the, that's the baggage I carry. And I don't consider yeah. it baggage, but that's just yeah. a way of putting it. You're, like you're I, hot, You like to be in everything. You got to make you know, sure. I mean, I don't burn bridges. I mean, Christian no. is one of my mentors, the Marley family. Yeah. I mean, Damien and Steven, that's like, I'm tattooed for life. I mean, that's yeah. my blood. I, there's, if they call, I, you know, they say jump, I say how high it never changes. So yeah. then, um, then I finally, after doing reggae's gone country, I bit the bullet and I told Chris and Randy, I had to move to Nashville and they yeah. were, they were sad, but they let me and I moved down here and literally within three months, I got the call from Damien and Damien's like, we need you to come back to ghetto use. So I came back in from, I was the president of it before when I was the president of Tough Kong and ghetto use. But at this time it was just to run that label again that we had built together. And I just came in as the director of operations doing the same basic job. But that was when Steve, um, Steven and Damien really started to sign acts because we had, we really kind of used it as an imprint. When I was at Def Jam, we had like a couple, we had a Julian record. Of course, we had Steven and Damien because they're the three who own it. But then we had like Javon, but that was the only kind of independent thing and maybe a rhythm album we put out. But when I came back in as the director of operations in 2013, that was when they had Christopher Ellis and yeah. Wayne Marshall. So got on top of that and we were we were chugging along at that. And then Damien jumped up one day and decided, you know, he wanted to invest in some other business ventures and decided he wanted to do a cruise. He'd never been on a cruise. I had never been on a cruise. His marriage had never been on a cruise. And yeah. we're like, okay. So, and I was like, okay, well, what's my job? Oh, you're going to run it. And I'm like, okay. So basically that's how <laughs> the well- everything else, like why not? <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. I actually loved it. And actually that's yeah. still what I do to this day. I mean, thanks yeah. to Damien, I kind of, I became, I've been doing it for seven years now. And yeah. I mean, welcome to Jamrock was just, you know, none of us knew what was going to happen. It was crazy. I mean, there's more yeah. in-depth stories of all these things that I've done, but that was a crazy one. And then I ended up doing some other cruises too. And then the label work and the cruise work got kind of a bit. So I kind of walked away from the label because we had some downtime because we were getting so involved in the cruise stuff, but still promoting the music at radio and stuff, but focusing more on the ships. Yeah. And then in 2017 was my last year on Jamrock. I decided um, I was offered another executive position with uh, Joe from Downsound. I was the okay. uh, vice president of creative planning and development for his company and uh, running Sunfest. Yes, so now yes. that I was doing cruises, I really liked the festival work and I liked the challenge of that. It just would have been too much for me to juggle both. So yeah. I, I walked away from Jamrock and then I went to Downsound and I ran I ran Sunfest. That's how we had Damian Marley on Sunfest that year. And yeah. I did I booked Steven the year before. So but I didn't stay, I didn't stay very long. It was, it was just kind of, it was difficult being in Nashville and in Jamaica and the traveling and just in the cruise industry still, I was, I still wanted to do ships. So um, the ships I was doing, I got back into that. So basically running ships still, but then uh, last year, my artist that I started with, we did a full circle. He came to me with an album. We'd been talking for years about getting the right music for him. And I kept telling him like, unless you can get me the right music, I don't know how I could serve a purpose. And yeah. Spraga gave me the right record and we produced um, yeah. Chilagong last year and we set yeah. records with that. It was amazing. He went number yeah. one on Billboard for the first time in his career, the oldest dancehall artist to do it. He was the first artist to perform at the Grammy Museum in Jersey. So, I mean, it was really great last year. It was unbelievable. I mean, both of us running around the United States of America promoting. We're both 50. I look yeah. like I'm 50. He still yeah. looks like he's 21 when we first met. It's, it's completely good. unfair. It's you know? weird you've been with him. That's why it was so nice to see you guys up to now doing it. Like, you know, that's why I said, wow, that's nice to see you too. Because I know you go way back, right? 
Oh yeah. Since the beginning. And like I said, I mean, I remember being on the road with him driving and I was like, how come I look like a soccer mom and you still look the way we did when you were 21? He goes, that's because you eat like crap. I'm like, Oh, thank you. Thank you. Old friends. He was like, the soccer mom and he playing soccer. Yeah. <laughs> to stay fit. So you got to watch what you eat. So yeah, perfect. I know. Yeah. I, know. <laughs> I get that all the time too. Cause my body's feeling, I know exactly all of them are telling us how to eat, you know? Right. So that's kind of my long story long, but I try to keep it short. <laughs> no, that was, that was like a, another thing, what you were saying about the, like, okay, you mentioned what you, what, uh, what won Grammys and what you were a part of. Do you remember each one of them? Cause you ran it down pretty quick, but what albums won Grammys? Out of um, all the, all the stuff that you were a part of, would you say, uh, do you remember each one that took home a Grammy? Well, I mean, there are definitely there are there are a lot of records that I've I've worked on that have been Grammy nominated or won a Grammy. But yeah. obviously, you know, the Recording Academy only acknowledges what's really in a CD booklet. So if your name isn't listed within the actual credits, they don't really acknowledge it. And when and a project is nominated or won, you get a certificate, which is actually on my opposite wall in my office. So I mean, the first album I worked. Uh, that won a Grammy was Sly and Robbie and Friends. But I actually um, didn't get my name on the credit because I started the project when it was already delivered to the label. So basically yeah. I did all the marketing promotions, but I wasn't listed marketing in there. So I actually worked it, but don't have a certificate for that. But obviously I have, oh, I have Mind Control from Steven, uh, Halfway Tree from Damien, Welcome to Jam Rock, um, The Doctor from Beanie Man, obviously Deaf Jamaica, Revelation Part One from Steven, um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, that's ba that's like the bulk of the ones I can think of off the top of my head. There's about I have like ten certificates, and then of course my um, nomination medal for um, Deaf Jamaica, which you also get a certificate as well with that too. Yeah, the Mind Control Acoustic also received. Uh, he got like two back to back for that, did he not? Um, I mean, it's crazy because people didn't realize you could do that. They're like, how can he win twice? But it's considered yeah. a new recording because he re-recorded it acoustically. So then to the Recording Academy bylaws, it actually is considered a new recording. So he could resubmit it. So he's very clever. <laughs> that, tell the story of that album, like the production, how you, you were saying that Damien had his production done by Stephen, the two of them together, Stephen and Damien. But tell... Uh, uh, what was the big, um, there was the, the one that Stephen Marley got. Talk about the story behind that, that you not thinking that album was like, it took a while. To right. Yes. Out. I actually, I actually say a lot of times in interviews, I think it's one of my, one of the, um, one of my best achievements because when, um, the melody makers broke up, Sylvia Roan, who was the head of Electra wanted to sign Stephen as a solo act. And he wasn't interested. Stephen was like, you know, he'd always been, he, there were on a Melody Maker record, there would be Stephen tracks, but the bulk of it was Ziggy. And he just really was just, you know, lending his contributions as a Melody Maker and a part of the family and very much so on the production side, which is really to this day still what he loves. He's just probably to me, the best producer we have in the genre, hands down. I mean, he's, yeah. he's like Prince. He plays every instrument, you know, so it's just it's rarity to find any producer that does what he does. But um, even when the Motown deal came in with Kadar, he wanted yeah. Steven and Steven told Kadar that he could, he would sign, but he had to sign his little brother first and he had to put out his little brother first. So that's how um, we put out Halfway Tree first. And it was yeah. a kind of a crazy story. And I mean, it's it's pretty well known. So D, you know, wouldn't care if I told it, not that it hasn't yeah. been told before. Yeah. Um, you know, we, that year I actually have a thing behind me too. It's actually the one I got my finger on. Yeah. There was like 14 nominations that year at the Grammys for Motown. And Indy Irie had her big record. She had seven of them. Uh, Damien was nominated for Halfway Tree. We, yeah. me, me and Damien went out to the Grammys with his mom. And, um, you know, he won. He was the only one who won that year for Motown Records. So we went to the after party. We're so excited. Damien <laughs> won his first Grammy. Um, you know, the next morning I'm in my hotel. I'm getting ready to take off to go back to New York because the Grammys were in L.A. And I got a call from Kadar Massenberg, who was the president of Motown. And he was like, oh, you know, you know, congrats on last night. I'm like, yeah, it was amazing. You know, we're so glad we can bring it home from Motown. And he was like, yeah, I just wanted to let you know that um, I'm dropping Damien. He's and I was like, what? Yeah. So literally the day after he wins the Grammy and mind you, 
Hemp Seed Free was also released on a Tuesday. And that Tuesday was September 11th, 2001. The day the towers went down was our release date. And we were supposed to do, um, I think it was David Letterman that night and we had to cancel it. So mind you, he had all the cards stacked against him. Cause mind you, all that promotion we had for that week all had to be on lockdown because the towers went down on our release day, which yeah. was devastating for us. I mean, obviously more devastating for the country and the world, but it was just, you know, that's the worst release date in history. So, um, and then to win the Grammy, it was like, that was quite an achievement because we kind of got off on the wrong foot with what was going on. And then to be told we're getting dropped. Well, the situation was they dropped Damien, but they did not drop Steven. Cause remember he wanted Steven. So it be, and Steven was, he was angry. Cause like, that's not how the deal's supposed yeah. to go. So, yeah. um, it took me 10 years to get mind control out and it didn't happen when Kadar was there because once Kadar was there, he ended up being removed and there was all these transitioning within the universal system. And then, you know, then I was working jam rock. I'm putting, putting the jam rock album together. I uh, released the, the single, try to, you know, uh, I was shopping at different labels. We almost ended up at another major. It was a very, it was a struggling time for us to really try to find D a new home. And I knew we had a hit and I was having a real hard time placing it. And then um, I just went to the family, asked them for the money I needed at radio. I told them, like, I believed in it. I knew we could do this independently. Let me just break this record. I know we can find a home. And they're like, look, we'll do it, but you better find a home. And sure enough, we started a bidding war with Damien. And at that point, it's kind of like behind the music. We yeah. actually signed him back to the label that he got dropped from. And no one's ever really done that. So, oh but at God. that time, it kind of transitioned into um, Universal Republic. Yeah. And Monty and Avery were over there. And, but there was a bidding where everybody was involved in. And at that point, sitting at the helm, I was like, oh, okay, well, I've been sitting here for X amount of years trying to get all of you guys behind it. Now everybody wanted it because now Jay Z is over at Def Jam. And then you've got Puffy. Like I was having, Puffy was calling me at home. You know what I mean? Like everybody was really trying to get this record. And technically yeah. at that time, he, out of any genre, Damien had the biggest bidding war in the music industry. And then we ended up going back to Universal and that's where, you know, that's where the Bob catalog was. It was just a, a familiar place for the family. Everything yeah. was kind of under one umbrella. Steven was still there. So at that time, mind you, then here comes Welcome to Jamrock. Still no Steven record. And yeah. Steven was working on one and I, we were working on it together and I heard the tracks and we're going back and forth, back and forth for like 10 years until finally in 2007, we released Mind Control. And I couldn't believe when we actually, I, I actually thought I was getting conned. <laughs> Many years ago, I was like, you're just going to keep playing me this music that I'm absolutely addicted to and no one's going to hear it but you and me and the kids. You know what I mean? It's like, and it's like, I mean, because it's kids are always there. So all of us can sing it together by ourselves. You know what I mean? So, but yeah, so I was, and then, you know, then he got more comfortable with doing albums. So of course, you know, we're a many in now, but it was, it was hard to get that first solo album. And it was, it, it, it it's, it's still one of my favorites and it's qu quite the accomplishment, not only for him, but I mean, for me, because trust me, I never thought I was going to get him to do it. Wow. I'm just shocked still about the Damian Marley getting the Grammy and then being dropped. Like who does that? Record companies are Girl, celebrating. I got stories for days. I was like, what? <laughs> what? That one I did not know. Yeah. Like, it's supposed to be the record company should be like, whoa, that is messed up. That one really messed up. See, so it's not all glitter and glam, people. You see no, that? not at all. Not, not at, at all. all. But that just shows you like the, you know, but that made us all stronger. And I mean, like I said, Jam Rock did so well. You yeah. know what I mean? And just, and it just is like in your face, you know what I mean? And we, you know, and then, but the great thing was is that the publicist that was there, um, the head of sales that was there, um, my marketing mentor, Andrew Kronfeld, that was with me in, at Island in 97, he was now the head of international. My uh, publicist, that the few people that supported us when we were at Motown were now in positions at this other, at that label that transitioned because they stayed, even though the Motown regime was out and Kadara was out. Um, there was a new team in, but the, the, the people who cheerleaded us were there. That was another thing that was attractive to um uh, go back to that label. And ironically enough, that publicist is one of my best friends still in the industry. She actually just did the press for Spraga. So, yeah. yeah, so she's, and she's worked with the boys still to this day. She's, they, she adores them. They adore her. And it's, you know, it's just a really good team of people that are still in the industry to this day. 
that we were able to go back and the, the cheerleaders were able, and that's what made it so successful. We had these fresh new blood that loved it, but then we had some really great executives that were big fans of uh, Damien and Steven's music prior to all the hoopla. And so it was good to have, you know, it's like swimming with sharks and we were surrounded by dolphins. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now we talked about that and we're on the talking about the wind for the Marlies. I want, because like you say, you're, you're part of the Grammy you're very close with the Grammy committee, or you were, you're not anymore, right? You were co-chairman of the Reggae Grammy screening committee for like over 12 years, correct? Yeah, I served on the committee from 2003. Well, was it was two? No, I got appointed in 2004, right after my Deaf Jamaica nomination in 2004. And I think my last year I served was like three years ago maybe like three or four years ago. So it was like 12, 13 years. And I was um, a co-chair for some of the time that I was on there. Yeah. Yeah. So I would like you to address because we get this all the time. If the Grammy nominations come out and there is a Marley there, everybody you will see, most of them will all say, no disrespect to the Marleys right now. This is just me talking the thing out. People say it. They're always saying, oh, if a Marley's in there, definite win for them. They're going to win. What, what do you feel about that? Well, when I got appointed in 2004, there was a reason I got appointed because there was a situation that went down with Sean Paul's first record and the gentleman that worked for the Academy that ran our, um, that ran our, uh, our uh, committee knew that there was an issue. So he had actually called um, a friend of mine that sits on some of the pop committees and said like, look, I need somebody to shake up my reggae committee. I feel like something's missing. And he, she was like, oh, do you know Christy? You know, she was just nominated for a Grammy this year. And so she did the introduction and I ended up serving that year. And I realized there, there was a lot of problems with, you know, there's, there's nobody was educated about how the Grammy process worked. Nobody. And at that time we weren't supposed to talk about the screening committees. They're still not really supposed yeah. to, yeah. but you know, the kind of cats out of the bag because, you know, hip hop and everybody's talking about the Grammys now. So people yeah. know about it now, but back then it was very, if you were on it, you couldn't speak about it. But then I realized um, when I went through the whole process and everything and I, I realized what was going on, we had we had a name recognition problem for the simple fact that in 2004, there was only one voter from the island of Jamaica. So what was happening in the reggae category was that anybody who was really a player in the Jamaican industry wasn't voting. It was people who might be more in jazz or R&B or rock were coming over to vote in our category and would go like for my, I, by the best case analogy I could give, it'd be like a white man from Minnesota, maybe in his forties would go over there and he'd look and go, Oh, burning spear. I love them. Or, you know, Lee scratch Perry, like he would only vote for the people he knew, you know, at yeah. that time he never, he didn't know who a Morgan heritage was at that time. He didn't know who a Barris Hammond was at that time. He just knew the people from like the seventies and the eighties when he was really listening to it. So yeah. we had this issue with the name recognition problem. So I went to the head of awards at the Grammys and I said, I wanted to do a campaign. I wanted to start a voter registration campaign. And they were very supportive. Obviously, I had to be secretive about my um, position on the committee, but I just, you know, when I started my interviews, I was backed by the Academy. I just said, you know, I know a lot of people there. I know the runnings. I know how it works. So I went, uh, you know, like the TV shows in Jamaica, like Sunrise and Smile Jamaica, which, you know, is like our, you know, yeah. uh, like our Good Morning Americas of Jamaica, yeah. all the radio, all the press, and just yeah. trying to teach people how to become a voting member because we had to have the players. So the people who knew, uh, because it's not like a lot of those artists haven't put records out that didn't go on Grammys, but there were yeah. a lot of these great records like Don't Have a Dread from Morgan Heritage. There's albums from Bears Ham. I mean, still to this day, Bears Hammond has not won a Grammy. That like is like that blows, literally that blows no. Me away. And he knows. We talk about this all the time. He knows yeah. I I am not leaving I, this earth until yeah. it is in his office in Jamaica. And I know he's all like, eh. I'm like, nope, nope, nope. That's my nope. life's goal. But yeah. I mean, so the issue is, it's not just the Marley family because that is a recognized name. There are a lot of other people that have that recognized name that get those nominations. And again, like I said, there are times when it deems worthy, but there are times when the name recognition isn't really fair against the people who actually should actually get the nominations or the win. So 
it's a little unfair to say, oh, every time a Morley's nominated. I mean, there were years where Julian and Kamani, and there were times like just because their name said Marley. I mean, uh, Joe Mercer's been in there with Marley. There's been times yeah. they've not gotten a nomination, but yeah. You know, and there are times when it garners it. Welcome to Jamrock deserved the Grammy. Mind control took me 10 years. Heck yeah, it deserved the Grammy. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's like, and you know, so it's just there, you know, so there's a lot of, that was a big problem and we're still dealing with it to this day. I mean, I've, like I said, I've been running my campaign. I still do it every yeah. year. I'm always doing Grammy interviews and still trying to educate people of the process. And I actually... I actually um, do submissions for artists that can't because in order to submit your records, you either have to be a voting member or a recognized record label. And I have it, I do it for free. Any artist that doesn't know the process and needs to get their album submitted, I'll do submissions for them for free just to get their, you know, if it's eligible and it's, and it's able to get in there, I will do it for them. I do it every year for at least anywhere it's between five to 10 acts and people are getting better with it. And, you know, with Morgan Heritage's win and a lot of these nominations, you yeah. see the, the change is coming, but there, it's yeah. still, a, it's still an issue in our category with name recognition. And I think they have it in a lot of categories because you see hip hop boys getting upset. And there's like a lot of people that get really, um, upset with the Grammys, but a lot of them are unfamiliar with the process. Like I said, I yeah. ran campaigns and um, with Avenged Sevenfold um, when I did Sting and Shaggy's, but I did it through Sting's people. So when you think of artists on that level, you would think they know exactly how this whole thing's ran, but a lot of people just don't really understand the process. So I actually yeah. kind of, again, open door policy. I don't charge anybody. I just think the more we educate people on how the, because it gets really tricky. It, the Recording Academy is changing things all the time. So, and yeah. it's, it's even to become a voter right now, is like getting a record label deal. So, I mean, it's like, you know, yeah. so it changes and they just need to be educated. I just don't want people to get frustrated over it because it's such a great accolade that, I mean, as you know, since I was 10 years old, I mean, I've just worshiped the Re Recording Academy and what it stands for. And I just, yeah. and yeah, so I just really like to see these artists, you know, get their just due. Yes, that's what I say. There's a lot of them out there that aren't getting the recognition at all. Um, as an example, if you can explain to me, because um, we were speaking about when somebody says they're a nominated producer, I'll use an example to you. Okay, if Morgan, Morgan Heritage won the Grammy, right? Mm -hmm. So if Morgan, Morgan Heritage CD, they're, they're the winner of the Grammy. If a musician or somebody was featured on it, on the whole album, um, can they say they were Grammy nominated producer or, or, or involved with it? And can they use that word? Can they say I'm a Grammy nominated musician, um, singer, cause I was featured on it. How can they say, are they able to say that or not? That's what I'd like to know. Well, actually, you know, every category is is different and album categories, which is what we fall under. We're a reggae album category. And um, in order to um, win in an album category, which is, these are, these are bylaws set by the Recording Academy, um, if it is nominated or if it wins, obviously the artist or the band is actually considered the nominee or the winner. And if a producer produces on the album, only an artist, a producer, and an engineer can get a Grammy in an album category. So if, you are, if you've produced 50% of the record or more, if you've engineered 50% of the record or more, you are a nominee or you are a winner, If it, depending on if it's just a nomination or a win. Now, if you're a producer on the more like Morgan Heritage, as you said, for example, if Morgan Heritage has 15 tracks on that album and you're a producer of one, you are not a Grammy nominated producer. You worked on a Grammy nominated album or a Grammy winning album, but to call yourself a Grammy nominated producer is, com is completely incorrect. What you are given is a certificate and you are only given a certificate if your name is in the CD booklet or on allmusic.com because those are the only two places that the Recording Academy will accept credits. So your name has to be listed there and you have to send $40 and I think the I think the rate went up, it's like 50 or 60 now and they send yeah. you a certificate, which I like we talked about earlier, I have 10 of those. Yeah. So I mean, if you, if you, unless you did like for Welcome to Jamrock, Damien, he won 
that year. So he walked away with the statue and Stephen walked away with the statue because Stephen produced the overall record. So if Stephen would have only produced one record, he would have walked away with a certificate like I did. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I was an A&R and I was an A&R for, so I can't say I'm a Grammy, I'm a Grammy winning A&R. I mean, I did over, I did A&R the whole album. I guess you could say that, but it's not recognized by the Academy. Like I said, um, for Deaf Jamaica, I am a Grammy nominated producer because when a various artist album is nominated in an album category, the producers of the overall album are the ones who walk away with the statues because there's just too many artists to count. So that's why I have the Tiffany medal that is given away at the nominees dinner the night before. And I mean, you can check it on Grammy.com. If you type your name in, if you're really a nominee or a winner, it will pop up on the Grammy.com site. So yeah. there are a lot of people in the music industry and I don't want to take away, you know, what they've done, but technically it doesn't make you, if you saying backgrounds, even if you sing backgrounds on every yeah. single song on that out, you still are not going to get a statue or a medal. You get a certificate. So technically, the 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 what the Grammy the Grammy only acknowledges in an album category the artist or the band, or a producer who's produced fifty percent or more of the record. So, yeah. I said that the wrong way. I said I want to either let my viewers know I knew that. But oh uh, yeah. Oh no 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 it. yeah no I know because we talked about that and how the Junos run too, which I find very in interesting as well. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, so there are a lot of people who throw those titles around that, that you know, so that didn't technically. But I don't want to take away from because there's just such great talent in Jamaica that yeah. actually has worked on these projects. But the correct wording is to say I worked. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not that I'm a Grammy nominated producer. The only way you're a Grammy nominated producer is if you produce 50% or more of an album in an album category that was nominated, period. Yeah, not just one track. One track does not make you a Grammy nominated producer. Yeah. Because that makes you a part of a project. That's why I'm saying because a lot of people put it out there and then like a musician or an artist who has been on the collaboration of the album, they put it out there. And to me, it makes their bio look better, but really and truly, like you said, you have to put in the work. It doesn't yeah. work like that. Like you're not the full, you're not more than 50% of it. So that's the way it works. And that, I mean, rightfully that's right because the Academy, like you said, they're, it's not like they're just giving away things like nothing. Like you said, I if, mean, anybody, if anybody saw my post of this advertisement of the show today, you will see Miss Barber here, Christy Barber, she's wearing. She yeah. Like I can, I, I mean, I can give you an example for that Morgan album. Um, you yeah. know, they actually, forgot to put the um, mastering studio credits on the CD booklet. And now yeah. everybody knows you got to master the album. And they had to go to the Academy because they wanted to get uh, they wanted to get a certificate for the the mastering house that had been working with them for years. Yeah. And the Academy was like their credit, their, their name in the credits. They're like, yeah, but it was our fault. We forgot to type it. Well, you yeah. didn't type it. So technically yeah. they're like, well, obviously we had to master this record. And the Academy was like, I don't yeah. know what to tell you. You're, it's not in the credits. The credits that we acknowledge, it's not there. So like I said, they're, they're sticklers. I mean, because remember, they have to, it, you know, because I mean, there's great awards all over the world, but everybody knows like it, when it comes to music, this is the most esteemed accolation you can get. So they got to be yeah. very tooth and nail with stuff. So yeah, I mean, you can say it, but doesn't mean it's yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. so. how, how do you feel though that we're talking about this on how they do it that way. Do you agree with it? Or, or do you feel like the, the musicians and those featured artists should get the credit or you agree with how they're dealing with it? I agree with how they're dealing with it because it could just get too chaotic. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think, um, I mean, you just, you can't, I mean, if you're in a singles category and you, and certain singles category, if you produce that song, you know, there's, there's different, there's different bylaws for that. But for an overall album, you have to remember it's a whole body of work. And I mean, things are changing now too. I mean, there's another thing that we're not, everybody's not too jazzed about that they're now accepting EPs in the album category. I was just gonna say that. Yeah, I mean, no, nobody's really jazzed about that. And especially for me, I'm an old dog. You know I mean? I still try to buy CDs if I can get my hands on them. And I still have every yeah. CD. You know me, I got all my vinyl. You know, we said this earlier. But I mean, it, but the thing is, I can't be mad because the Academy allowed it. But it, yeah. it seems so unfair. Like, the, you know, the artists that put, you know, 12, 15 tracks on an album, they spend a year putting it together. And you can put together 
as long as it's like an EP has to be at least um, 30 minutes of playing time. Yeah. And if, as long as you've got 30 minutes of playing time and you could it's have five tracks, it's considered an album. And that's a lot easier to put together. So like right now, that, that encourages artists, unfortunately, to kind of phone it in. And I know it's very difficult right now. There's no money in music as far yeah. as the music sales and records and all that stuff. It just kind of takes away from... I don't know. You know, it's just, a, that's just one of my personal things about how I just, the streaming and even the downloads, it's been so hard for me. It just take there's just something special about going to the record store and yeah. buying that vinyl or even buying back in the cassette tape days of that CD yeah. and holding it in your hand and looking at the art and reading. Yeah. Like the. I used to read the credits when I was just a fan, like that was yeah. like everything. And now it's like, it's just, I just feel like it just makes me sad, you know what I mean? Because yeah. there's such an art to it and the artist put so much blood, sweat and tears into it. And that yeah. kind of artistry is kind of lost in the wind a little bit. So, yeah, that's what just like me when I get it for radio, I don't even know who did it or whatever. I like to kind of say that, you know, and I don't know. And you got to ask them who did this, whatever. And it kind of, you're right. I like that too, how it used to be. But like we say, times are changing. How was your feeling on coffee taken at home? The, the well, grandma? I, well, I'm, I'm very happy about it for the simple fact that, you know, it shows the campaign of, you know, getting the word out there with these new artists. I mean, obviously the EP thing I wasn't jazzed about, but I can't yeah. be mad at her. The Academy no. set that rule. And if they set the rule, she can slide the EP in. And a lot of people come to me, ask me as an expert, you know, a lot of journalists, a lot of people who want to, you know, do their picks or who they think is going to win or be nominated. And I told people I knew that she I said, look, I'm I'm I got a gut feeling she's going to get a nomination. But I told him if she gets a nomination, she's going to take the win. And a lot of yeah. people are like, are you kidding? You really think so? And I'm like, trust me, if she has yeah. the impact coming out the gate to get a nomination, she's yeah. definitely going to take the win. And I was actually there this year and you, you could hear it like a pin drop. All you could hear is her on stage and me screaming because, I, you yeah, know, I, heard, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so great to have like. This 19 year old girl in his dance hall, and I haven't seen anybody spit like that in dance hall. I mean, like Lady Saw, and then, um, you know, this girl, Alakai Harley out of the UK, who I'm, I just absolutely love and I've been working with since last year. But I mean, I like her. the lyricist, oh, yeah, she's amazing. She's such a sweet soul, too. But I, I mean, it was just some more of her stuff. I love oh, her. yeah, yeah, definitely. And I mean, just, you know, coffee, just it was just great to see this young girl, it was just, it's like a Cinderella story. So yeah, no, I couldn't help but get up and scream. You'd have thought I was her mama the way I was yelling. I, <laughs> I heard you go. I actually saw the post on yours when I saw it because I was busy. I'm like, I'm just going to go on Christie's page and I'll know who wins. I'll just go and look who she posts quick. But um, how did you feel? I was, I was happy for her, but I was happy more that it was a female. I can't tell you no lie. Yeah. I was like, yes, yes. You know, I was very happy. And um, for third world, I was like, I would have liked two for them because they're just their contribution to the industry. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, deserving of what they've put in for their years of, you know, work and, and to our industry. Yeah. So we got about four minutes left. Um, do you want to shout out anybody before we get going? And, and of course, all your social media, if you want anybody to link you up and follow you. Well, I'm actually, it's so funny. I kind of hid myself on Instagram. I don't, that, it, it, there, there's like a Christy Barber that's out there that only has like one post and people think it's me, but it's not. I actually, I call myself Christy of Aragon because I'm obsessed with Henry VIII. So oh. it's actually, so if you typed in and it's Christy without an H, which everybody messes up. So it's like C-R-I-S-T-Y of yeah. Aragon. So that's yeah. how you find me on Instagram. And then of course I'm Christy Barber on Twitter and I'm Christy Barber on Facebook, but yeah, no, I mean, um, those are my socials, but no, I mean, I think, you know, obviously uh, to shout out anybody, I guess, you know, there's, I mean, all, I mean, we could be here all night if I started shouting people out. Oh, I know. You know a lot of people. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, if you, it depends on what I'm shouting out. Am I shouting out my artists? Am yeah. I shouting out the people that have helped me throughout the years? Am I shouting out my mentors? Who do you want me to shout out? <laughs> well, you gotta, you gotta shout out hubby. You can't leave hubby out. You gotta oh, shout yeah. out hubby. And yeah, mommy. no, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yes, mommy, yes, 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 my friend. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. For sure. Yeah, no, yeah. definitely my family, who's my big support system. My husband is also an artist. He's Lord Abstract. Super yeah. proud of him. He's doing amazing work as well. So I'm really, and he actually did a track with Alakai Harley. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. So she oh, actually did a track with him. Yeah. It's really, really cool. So, um, yeah. And I mean, obviously just shouting you and your family out again, because you know, that's, 
those are the type of recognitions I like to give and educate people so that they know, because a lot of people just kind of know what they know, especially the younger generation don't. Yeah. And I, th I just think there's a, a, I'm just so happy that I got in the industry at a time where I can be mentored by people like Gussie Clark and Chris Chin and Donovan Germain and um, Danny Brownie, who was like my first office oh. Main Street crew was my first crew in Jamaica. So big up Danny Brownie. I used yeah. to stay at his house when I went to Jamaica. I was like his little kid. So yeah. yeah. And, and your dad, like I said, I mean, what, what, a, what a reggae treasure Carl was. So, you know, I'm just so happy that I actually came in at that time where I could really be nurtured by these amazing, amazing executives. So yeah, that, there, that's my shout out right there. <laughs> yes. And I am so glad that they pushed you, Christy, because I know all of them did. And I'm so glad that you stuck it out because I'm sure with a, you being a woman in this industry, at first, it's probably hard for people to take women serious. Oh, so yeah. I'm so glad to see you 28 years. And I know you got so much more to, to go. I don't know how you did what you did. And I know you got so much more to go. And congratulations on all your success. And I wish you could show them your room right now. But <laughs> it's full, people. It's full. I mean, she's done so much. I, you are a legend, Christy Barber. We appreciate what you've done. God Back bless you. you and um, your family, and I wish you all the best. Thank you so much for being on the Tanya Mulling Show on the Barn Burner TV Network, Zinco TV, Channel 250. We'll catch you same time, same place next week. Thanks for having me, and big up Canada. We love Canada. <laughs> Canada.